Young Show. Hello. Do you consider yourself a good judge of character? Well, most of us do. Uh, at least, we like to think we are. Miss Anita Dodd, principal of Jefferson High, tells our story. It was the opening day of school when I met Emil Kronstadt for the first time. Mr. Morton, our superintendent of schools, had called a faculty meeting to touch off the semester. As soon as I saw Emil Kronstadt, I knew he must be the new physics teacher. His clothes were of a cheap foreign cut. And I just knew that his socks would be ugly, silky, with runners in them. And so it is that I have Real pleasure in introducing to you Jefferson High's answer to the Sputniks, Mr. Emil Kronstadt, formerly of Budapest, Hungary. Mr. Morton is much too flattering. I'm only the small part of an answer to a Sputnik. There are no three-stage rockets under me for propulsion, only two feet, and they, alas, are flat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kronstadt, and I'm sure that the faculty joins me in welcoming you to Jefferson High. Well, I'll not keep you any longer. I know how anxious all of you are to get to your first classes. Oh, just a minute, Mr. Kronstadt. I want you to meet your principal. Miss Dodd's been with us for some 12 years now. How do you do? Very glad to know you. I understand you also teach? History. You've seen your classroom? Oh, they're beautiful. I've never seen a school like that. Big modern rooms, really beautiful. Well, I'm glad you approved. Second bell. If you'll excuse me. Somehow, he irritated me. Maybe it was his clothes. Or perhaps it was his accent. Whatever it was, I felt I didn't like him. That is not a dirty word on the board. That's my name. <laughs> now, this is a nice class. It's not too big. In here, we mean business. If you don't study, you'll flunk out, just like this. But if you want to study physics, you won't flunk out. Mostly I talk, mostly you listen. You work hard, you do fine. But in here, we don't play games. The eraser goes up, comes down again. But what happens in between? For one tiny second, a microsecond, what happens? All right. I'll do it again. <laughs> so good. Somebody at least made an observation. The young lady thinks teachers look silly throwing up erasers. What is your name, young lady? Laurie Williams. Well, Laurie Williams, at least you have expressed an opinion. Now, what does the eraser do before it starts to fall? Yes? I think it hesitates, sir. Right, good. That's what I want you to see. Now, why did it hesitate? I don't know, sir. Anybody? Anybody knows why? All right. The reason why it hesitates is that for one small moment, the force that was moving it upward is exactly equal to the force of gravity. That's why it hesitates before it starts to fall. You've never heard of this? You have a lot to learn. Today I earn my salary. There it is. About a week later, I waited for an opportunity to speak to him. Mr. Kronstadt. Oh, Mr. Stott. I would like to speak to you for a moment. Yes, what is it? Well, uh, not out here, in my office, if you please. Well, I'm in a bit of a hurry. I have some equipment to prepare for the next class. Oh. Permit me, please. Oh, thank you. Perhaps you would like to see it? It's a big electromagnet. Pulls the hairpins right out of your head. Well, some other time, perhaps. Just sit down, Mr. Kronstadt. Right. Cigarette? No, thank you. Is it all right if I smoke? No, it is not all right. There's a rule against it. No smoking in the school or on the grounds. And if I were to break the rule, then what? You would receive a note from me. A note from you, Miss Dodd? 
I'm very much tempted. Mr. Kronstadt, I am serious, please. I'm sorry. All right. What did you want to talk to me about? Well, several things, as a matter of fact. First, I believe that I had already explained to you our system of taking roll call in the classrooms. Yes, certainly you did. Then why have you not been using it? I've been calling the rolls. Oh? Well, then those who told me otherwise must be mistaken. You have spies in my classroom, Miss Dodd? I shall have to reprimand them for deceiving me about your role taking. No. There's no need. They were confused. You see, I don't use the roll book. I just remember who's absent. I keep my grades the same way. You try to memorize your records for five classes a day? <laughs> I see you find it hard to believe. All right. Now, you teach history, Miss Dodd. Correct. What is your class studying right now, the most advanced course? Early French history. All right. Then let me quote to you from the memoirs of Philippe de Comines. I'm sure you're reading that. Name any part you wish. Or would you rather hear the Chronicles of Froissart? I can quote it to you in the original French, in modern French, or in English. That will not be necessary. I shall take your word for your unusual memory. Thank you. You said several things. Something else is troubling you? I understand that you are using the lecture system. I talk, yes. Well, you see, as a matter of fact, we no longer use the lecture system exclusively. We like to consider the whole student. His home environment, his schoolroom adjustment, his educational psychology, and so forth. Oh, I see. Well, frankly, Mr. Kronstad, I have been told that you expect a great deal from your students. And that is bad? Some of the parents tell me that you, that you overwork them, that you give them so much homework, they're, they're studying hours every evening, which leaves no time over for recreation, no time at all. Now, that's most interesting. You mean to say you don't believe in homework, in discipline? I didn't say that. Is it all right if I have a drink of water? Of course it's all right if you have a drink of water. I simply said, it seems to me, you are working your children very hard indeed. Miss Dodd, I have yet to find a shortcut to learning. Yes, it is hard work. But I hope they will discover that hard work can be fun too. Yes. Well, now, about the complaints. How many complaints have you had? Two or three. Two or three out of five whole classes? Yes. Oh, Miss Dodd, this is most encouraging. Perhaps the rest are learning something. And those are the ones I teach. The others will fail anyway. But if I were to slow down for the lazy ones, then I would be the one who's failing. All right, Mr. Kronstadt, I won't keep you any further. We'll discuss this again some other time. It will be a pleasure. <laughs> I want to hear something funny. When I was a boy in Budapest, I thought American women wore bathing suits all the time. Oh, really? But... <laughs> Look, you must be patient with me. I've been in this country for only six months. I've been teaching in Budapest for 22 years. I have much of your American ways to learn. Yes, well, I don't think this is the time to discuss it, Mr. Kronstadt. As I said, we must be patient. Good day. Good day. The weeks passed at Jefferson High, and we all settled down to the routine of the school season. I tried to be patient with Mr. Kronstadt, or thought I tried. To be perfectly honest, all I did was to ignore him. And this was difficult, because Mr. Kronstadt seemed to be everywhere. And the students all talked about him continually. Some of them, at least the brighter ones, praised him. Others, especially those who were afraid of flunking, talked of him as if he were some kind of an ogre or a clown. Then it happened. Gloria Shoemaker brought me the news. Anita, have you heard about Emil Kronstadt? Mm, I have heard a great many things about Emil Kronstadt, Gloria. Haven't we all? Mm. I mean about what happened this morning. What happened this morning? You better go into your office. Oh, yes, sure. Well, 
This morning, he asked one of his girl students to stay a minute after class. Yes? It was Lori Williams. And then, he made an indecent proposal. I certainly picked a good one. I imagine Lori Williams knows an indecent proposal when she hears one. It's all over school. If this turned out to be only a silly little notion of Laurie's, it would be unfair to use it against him. On the other hand, if there was a grain of truth in it, and he certainly was a weird one, he might be capable of anything. What did he say to her? I don't actually know. Laurie went home right afterwards and didn't tell anyone. I see. But she and her mother are in the faculty room with Mr. Norton now. Oh, that's why I'm here. Norton asked me to tell you there'll be a meeting at 4 o'clock. He wants you to be there. A scandal in the making, doesn't it? I know how you must feel, Anita. There's been no mistaking your attitude toward that man. <laughs> I just never felt he was right for Jefferson High, that's all. Well, that's me. Gloria. Yes? Do you think Laurie's telling the truth? He must have said something. There was something I should have done weeks ago. Sit in on one of his classes. I knew that I had to do it now, before that meeting. Therefore, 1 over CT equals 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. Now then. So what is a condenser? We say it has capacitance, or capacity. Now, what else do we speak of having capacity? A water tank. Somehow, I felt as if I had been caught spying on him. And yet, it was part of my duty to be here. My first feeling was irritation. He was lecturing the students, and he knew I did not approve of that method of teaching. But soon, I forgot my irritation and became interested in what he was saying. I began to see and feel the energy that he was talking about. And the class, miracle of miracles, the class seemed to understand them. I could see that almost all of them were with him, following him as I was. He was brilliant. He was superb. I'd seen nothing like him ever. Toward the end of the class, after the suspense with the electrons had become almost intolerable, he touched a metal rod to one side of a condenser and brought it near the other side. I gasped at it involuntarily, along with the students. And then I looked at his face. He was smiling beautifully. I knew what that meant. He was watching people learn. It was the finest thing that a teacher can do, the very best of all the rewards the profession could offer. It struck me suddenly that here was a man who knew his field and loved it, who loved deeply and strongly to teach. And suddenly, I was ashamed. I became aware of a thing that I had once known, but that years of professional training had made me forget that all the watered-down, progressive coursework that made up the training of a so-called modern teacher could not produce the one finest thing that an intelligent child can ever encounter in a schoolroom, a devoted teacher with a fine mind and a deep love for and knowledge of subject. Well, your assignment for tomorrow will be to read a chapter on capacitance and capacity for reactance. Dismissed. I'm very glad you came to my class. It's an honor. I hope I didn't bore you with all this electricity. No, not at all. It was fascinating. You're a remarkable teacher, Mr. Kronstadt. Remarkable. Thank you. I, uh, I think it's only fair to tell you there's going to be a little meeting this afternoon in the faculty room at 4 o'clock. Mr. Morton is going to discuss your pupil relations. I think you should be present. Okay, I'll be there. Thank you. But why must you be so stern when you tell me about it? Well, uh, Just a minute ago, you were so soft and confused, like a young girl. Very charming. <sighs> Mr. Kronstadt, I came in here on business only. The name is 
Emil. And Anita is such a lovely name for such a lovely woman. Mr. Kronstadt, act your age, please. Emil. It's Emil, Anita. And I am acting my age. The age of a lonely middle-aged man who so much would like to talk to. A fine, intelligent woman. I thought how really nice he seemed. And then I remembered Laurie Williams. What kind of a man is this, I wondered. Uh, remember, the faculty room at 4 o'clock, Mr. Kronstadt. And that is as it should be, for there's a great deal of honor and responsibility in the teaching profession. A burden, if you will, that all teachers must carry with them. The school board has been very pleased with the exceptional record that we've had here at Jefferson High. Never before has there been even a breath of scandal. And not to mar that record, and not to have to bring this before the board, I personally would prefer a dignified resignation. For these reasons, Mr. Kronstadt, I, representing the school board, and Mrs. Williams, feel that you should make an account of yourself. What do you mean, Mr. Morton, an account? About what you said to Laurie Williams. But what did I say? You... You made me stay after class and said that... We talked about my... My under things. Well, you're always saying crazy stuff in class, Mr. Krogstein, but... But this was... Well, private. She cried all morning, Mr. Morton. Everybody in town knew something like this would happen. Everyone knows what a queer one he is with his funny talking and that smart alecky smile of his. And you think that I tried to be indecent with this little girl? Well, you tried something with her. You think because she goes all painted and tries to be like a movie person that I, a lecherous old man? You think so too, Mr. Morton? I haven't heard your explanation yet, Mr. Kronstadt. I'm willing to be fair. Fair? Oh, sure. This is why you call this, called all this, without even bothering to ask me privately what I said to this child. You look at the Emil Kronstadt and you say to yourself, now there's a funny-looking Hungarian fellow, and I'm sure he makes indecent remarks to little high school girls because he talks funny, and he flunks out his lazy students. And you say to yourself, oh, we must see that our little girls do not get mistreated. So naturally, you decide to have a, a little trial. Only you don't have the decency to tell Emil Kronstadt what he's accused of. You have it all figured out in your own mind what I've done to all you good people. That's nice. All right, you've had your nice little trial. And I'm guilty. I said bad things to Laura here. All you have to do is pass the sentence, and then it's all finished. No, no, there's no need to take it that way, Mr. Kronstadt. Aren't you being overexcited? Overexcited? Maybe. But with just this kind of a little trial, I lost my brother. You see, he didn't know what he was accused of either. But in the Hungarian People's Republic, they don't waste time with that. They shot him, though. Very efficient. Mr. Kronstadt, Mr. I... Morton, there's no need to fire me. I'll leave. You've been letting me for a long time know that I'm not welcome here. No, wait. Please, sit down. Please, Mr. I, I, I wish you would sit down. You've made me thoroughly ashamed of myself. Sit down, if only for a few moments. Thank you, Mr. Kronstadt. Laurie. Laurie? Yes. Yes what? Yes, Miss Dodd. Laurie, what exactly did Mr. Kronstadt say to you? Well, go ahead, Laurie. Whatever it is, I'm sure we can stand it. We have all been thoroughly embarrassed as it is already. Well, Mrs. Williams, do you think you can make her repeat it? Well, I... I don't know exactly if she should. You don't exactly know. You mean it's all right for her to run home from school and fill your head with some kind of a story and to get the whole school buzzing about it? It was all right for you to come directly here to Mr. Morton with all sorts of accusations, but now you're, you're not exactly sure whether Laurie should repeat them here? 
You're, uh, you're not exactly sure whether we should hear the evidence against this man before we send him away from our school and our town in disgrace? I'm sorry. All right, Laurie. Tell us what he said to you. He said that I was flirting and distracting part of his class. Yes. He said that a girl my age shouldn't be so forward. That I shouldn't wear falsies. Falsies? Yes. Is that what it was? Yes. All of it? Well, I was never so shocked in my life. <sighs> I'll bet. <laughs> well, Laurie, do you wear them? Maybe Mr. Kronstadt is abrupt at times. But do you think we should call his remarks indecent? They might be very pertinent, though short on tact. Mr. Martin? Perhaps we owe Mr. Kronstadt an apology. Well... No, no, no. I owe Mrs. William an apology, and Laurie, too. I should have been more careful. I must learn of American ways. Well, yes, all right. I guess it was a misunderstanding. We're sorry, too, aren't we, Laurie? Uh, yeah. Come on. We can't hang around here all day. Stop. Mrs. Williams. Goodbye, Laurie. Bye, Good Mr. Martin. I'm terribly sorry that we troubled you in this way, Mr. Cronstadt. I had no idea that it was just... <laughs> well, no matter now. I'll be in touch with you, Miss Dobbs. Yes, and thank you, Mr. Martin. You know, I... I think I know now why we... we were all against you from the very first day you came to Jefferson High. You see, for years we had talked so much about education and learning. Well, so much so, in fact, that when we finally ran up against a truly educated man, we, we didn't realize what he was. We were afraid of him. You're very good to say that, but it's not quite correct. I was strange to you, that's all. But I liked you very much the way you talked to us in here. You were magnificent. You're a lovely woman. All right. And lonely? Like Emil Kronstadt? Yes, Emil. Lonely. I shall have to write you a note. Please do. Here's Loretta. Thank you, John. No man can justly censure another, because indeed, no man truly knows another. Well, good night. And we'll see you next week. Be with us again next week. Same time, same station. <laughs> <laughs>